funny looking fella. That doesn't look Hello. like Keith Donnelly. Are you Keith Donnelly? Are you Keith Donnelly? Are you? No, no. I'm not Keith Donnelly. Can you hear me? <laughs> no, you're far too sane. You're far too sane, Bruce. So I don't know. It's Hasn't not... he woken up yet? No, he hasn't. No, no, no. But at times, I must admit, you, can, you, can, be, you can be pretty mad yourself at times. <laughs> Oops, you're gone. Yeah, uh, I don't know what happened to Bruce. He just suddenly disappeared. Oh, he's still on. He's just videos off. Yeah, I got an email from Keith Donnelly at, at, um, about, about an hour ago saying, about basically in half an hour, hey, is there a way to stick the PayPal link in the corner of the screen somewhere? No worries if not. No, I'm, I'm planning on emailing a text that to everybody anyway. Don't, there, Rob. Is, there is a way to do that, but it's complicated. It's very complicated. You need to use something called uh, of open based thingy. There he is. There he is. I recognise. I recognise the accent. Ay, oh. <laughs> I don't. Oh. Very, very dapper. Ah, oh, yes. Straighten your tie, though. It's a bit crooked. I think. Oh, oh, I oh, see you. Oh, um, you brush your hair, Keith. Yeah. Hey, I, uh, you so <laughs> <laughs> Hello, we haven't met you. Yes. Wow. Oh, I've heard a lot about yeah. you. <laughs> All good. Yeah. Yes, really. Oh, Let me rename you, you ignorant peasants. You're not called iPhone. Hang on a second. There's Kyle. Hello, Kyle. Hi, Kyle. Hey, Duncan. Hello, Kate Johnson. Whoa. I tell you that. No, she can't hear you. Good morning. Hello, Kate Donkin. <laughs> Very good. Look, look at your blue sky. Yeah. Well, we've well. got a heavy frost outside. Well, we're not actually sitting out in the middle of the, of the intersection. <laughs> oh, you fake. Hello, <laughs> girl. Hey. So Keith, uh, Kate, Kate used to be uh, living here in Australia, was in Lucy Wogan for many years, but she's gone back home to the UK now, so she's over in your part of the world. Not so, quite. He's in the North East and I'm in Mid Wales, but oh, really. Yeah. <laughs> we're in Leamington Spa, so not that far, Kate. Where are you? Leamington Spa. Oh, right. But it sounds as though you're from the North East. And I have a husband with the surname of Donkin. All right. Which is from your, which he's very proud of. Which is up up in um, where is it? Sunderland. Oh, well, that's yeah, that's, that is the northeast. We're yeah. in a place called Covington, which is the northeast of Leamington Spa. Right. That's so the accent. What, what are you doing in Leamington Spa then? Um, not a lot at the moment. <laughs> yes. Has it been a long time? Yeah, yeah I, I, came, I, I came down to go to university a couple of years ago and I never quite ah. escaped. Right, well done. Hello, Bruce and Jill Watson. Yeah. Oh, hello. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Kyle. Kyle. Oh, hi, Kyle. Kyle. Hi, Kyle. Hi. How are you? Good to see you. Yeah, Last time good. I saw you, you were singing on my video. Oh, I'm out of That's tune. right. That's right. <laughs> Ursula Guile, I think my guitar. Hi. Hi, Di and Gary. Hello. You want to unmute oh. yourselves? Unmute. Take unmute. You, you'll need to mute when they're performing, but for the moment, leave it unmuted so we can have a chat. Hi, uh, yeah. <laughs> We're about to you. Are you North Lincolnshire. North Lincolnshire. I'm going to add that to your name. Do you mind? I just think it's nice if we have. Um, <laughs> yeah, fine. No, yeah. No yeah, where people are. <laughs> Hello from Mid Wales. Mid Wales, okay. I'll put Mid Wales instead of UK there on you, Kate. How about that? Yeah, well, Mid Wales is different from England and Scotland <laughs> and Ireland. And Wales. <laughs> Do you know they speak Welsh where I live? I haven't got a clue what they're saying. They speak English until I until I turn up, and the minute they hear me, they turn into Welsh immediately. 
Especially in the butchers. Do you think they're talking about me? I don't know what they're saying. It's a very faint, very strange language. The only word I know is dim, which is no. That's about it. Oh, and barada, which is good morning, and that's about it. But hey, Robert, you, know. you popped in a bit earlier, didn't you? But um, you tried to get in a bit earlier, Robert. Yeah, yeah. Whereabouts are you from, Robert? Where are you? Croydon, South Croydon. Oh, you're in Sydney, right? I'll, I'll put Sydney because people won't know where Croydon is. No, no, no. South Croydon, the Croydon. proper one. Yeah, Croydon, is it Croydon? Oh. South Croydon. Sorry, in England. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I think oh, it's sorry. One of these second-hand ones. <laughs> Oh, in Melbourne as well. <laughs> just everywhere. Excuse my ignorance then. <laughs> well, so at don't... least it's South Croydon, not North Croydon, which is better. Which is South Croydon is better than North Croydon. And Duncan, where are you? Duncan, are you there? Duncan, do you want to unmute? And where? Oh uh, yeah, I'm in. I'm I'm in Guildford, but not Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. No, no. You're just trying to confuse me. So where are you in Guildford? That UK as well, is it? Absolutely, yeah, UK. Sorry. sorry. Duncan, you're just a small sorry. Are we going to, line, are we going to get to see you, Duncan, or are we just going to look at your handsome picture the whole time? Um, <laughs> yeah, just the picture for the moment. Oh, ah, yeah. You, you probably get his underwear or something. Keith won't mind you being in your underwear, will you, Keith? <laughs> we the first time. <laughs> <laughs> and Irene, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, yeah. And um, I can get... oh, there you are. Good on you. And where about yeah, well, you, I'm, Irene? I was hiding. I was hiding. I'm in Derby in the UK. <laughs> Derby, right. <laughs> I'll add that to your name if you don't mind, so that people know where you are from. Oh, and Dallas. <laughs> And Trish, good evening. The Baxters, I know where you are. <laughs> good on you. In sunny Balmain, and I've, I've spent the day in the sun looking at trams, celebrating 60 years since the last tram in Sydney. And when I went to pay Keith then, I sent him a bill for $30. And so I've hopefully cancelled <laughs> that. And, and I guess I sent him about, about 30 quid instead. So. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> so, yeah. That's very kind of you. Thank you. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. <laughs> You've been looking at Trumps. <laughs> Trams. <laughs> Trams. Trams. Bit chilly for Trumps. Yeah. <laughs> at the moment. Very nippy. <laughs> I think there are more palms on here than I've ever met in one go before. <laughs> well, there you go. And um, so, I, so who we got here? Irene. Are you there, Irene? Oh, that's the one we done before. Sorry. I, I am. Oh, I've done, sorry, I've done, Nari. I've done you. Ian, Ian, Van. Yeah, where, how are you? Where are you from, Ian? From Melbourne. Ah, yeah, you're <laughs> right. Um, Mr. Really? <laughs> how are you, Keith Ursula? Good to see you. Good to see you. I'm so glad that someone, someone from Australia is watching. It's yeah. only oh. looking Bruce at the moment. <laughs> We've got quite a few. What about you, Bob? You're not Bob. You don't look like a Bob to me. Hey, Bob. What's your name? And where are you from, Bob? Uh, I don't know how I've got that one. Um, I should change name? my name. Hang on, I'm going to let you into a secret. I can do it if you like. All right. All right. You do it. Ah, and whereabouts are you? I'm in Canberra. Ah, right. The National Folk Festival. Yes. Yes, I know. We won't mention that for the second year um, running. Hello. Anne from Sydney. Hello. Uh, good on you, Anne. Is it a hump full? Hump full. Uh, regular. Regular. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Anne. Hi, very good. We saw Tessa briefly. Yeah, we saw Tessa briefly. I think they're covering everybody, aren't we? I think we've got Tessa. No. Where is? Are you there, Tessa? Hello? No. Hello? Tessa, are you there? Mm -hmm. no. All right. Okay. 
And uh, mm. z- 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 we got one, two, three. Mm. So we got 16 at the moment. Mm. So Sam, you know, Sam, Samantha O'Brien's not actually Sydney, but it's sort of, you know, it's, it's uh, Jamboree. Used to be Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Sam. Hey, Kate. Yeah. Hi. Hi. You look really well. You too. Thanks. <laughs> been a long time now 2011 yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> you still look like a baby a young man. <laughs> you're always the baby of the of the team <laughs> after, after girl of course <laughs> i can can i hear cicadas yeah that's up my house yeah. Okay, and we got Howard. Um, Howard, area. You there, Howard? No. And Tessa, where are you from? Testing in the UK. This is the one I mentioned. Hi. Yeah, I'm from the UK. Sorry, I was just making a coffee it's a bit early. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's okay. <laughs> So you're from the UK, all right? Yep, yeah, yeah, South Wales. South Wales. Oh, all right, there you go. <laughs> Stephanie Crowley, Crowley doesn't look like a Stephanie. Where's Stephanie? Can't see. Oh. Roberti. Stephanie Rowley. Yeah, who are you, Stephanie? You don't look like Stephanie. Mr. Rowley, hello, Stephanie. Yes. Oh, hello? Mr. Rowley. Mr. Rowley? <laughs> no? No, right. not listening. Okay. The man down the bottom of my screen with the name Stephanie Rowley, but um, you don't look like Stephanie Rowley. Stefan, maybe. Stefan? Oh, there you are. Hello. Yeah, what's your name? Oh. No, we're on mute again. Oh. Yeah, what's your name? Sorry. And where are you from? Hello? Not talking. Hello, Noni. Frozen. Hello. Brandon, um, Hello. Wayne, I think the name no, probably is Remy. Okay. Noni's in purple. Hello, Noni. That's unusual. <laughs> <laughs> you look just the same. So do you. Thanks. How's it going? Yeah, it's going good. Yeah, it's going good. Yeah. Well, it's um, it's just on eight o'clock. Um, Keith, do you, do you want to? Uh, oh, there we are. There's Stephanie. Is that you, Stephanie? Rally down the bottom there. Is it? Yeah. Stephanie, hello. <laughs> hello. Stephanie. Hello. Yeah, where hello. are you from? Sydney. Hey. Oh. Sydney. Say Sydney. Is that her? Yeah. Sydney, Australia. Whereabouts in Sydney? Okay. Very good. We're, we're building up the the. Australia contingent. And so your name's what? Well, you're Stephanie, are you? And, yeah, and Graham. And I'm Graham. Remember Wayne from years ago? Oh. <laughs> Graham. That's why Graham wasn't answering. Graham with a hey. Oh, Graham Gillay. Correct. Oh, my sister's former boyfriend. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's priceless. A few, a few, a few decades ago, mind you. Yeah. But well, that five. Some time and you haven't been to Humphrey yeah. for a while, have you, Graham? But did you, did you come to Keith's concert, did you? Do you remember we, seeing him here? We were there last week uh, remotely, yes. Oh, yes. You, you watched the, um, the the streaming concert we did with us. Yeah, I oh, did. Yes, yeah. we did. We're going to be doing a live performance of that in a couple of weeks out of South Taramara, which is going to be good. Oh, right. Anyway, well, okay. Well, wow. So, um, all right. Well, I think, well, Christine Connolly, are you there, Christine? I'm here, but I'm just fiddling about um, doing some things first thing in okay. the morning. So whereabouts are you, Christine? Where do you live? I'm in South Ryslip in uh, the outskirts of London, North London. Okay. Hi, Christine. Hi. Uh, okay. Yeah. Hi, so uh, you know each other. Very good. And we got a Howard. Oh, we haven't made... Oh. You there, Howard? No? All right. Okay. Well, why don't... Uh, do you want to... You reckon you should get going now, Keith? No, let's just let's just talk for the next couple of hours. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Let, let, let me let me do let me do my my little introduction. A little my little introduction to Keith, right? So I've got two little two little things I, I want to tell you about Keith, right? Um, 
<laughs> Will my he? Oh, I'm not forgetting where is it? Um, Keith uh, stayed stayed here um, at Hum Fall. By the way, this is Hum Fall. Sit back up. There you go. That's everybody. If you haven't seen Hum Fall, that's that's it. Um, the uh, that that's a. Sorry, I'm not used to pointing here. That's the after what used to be a Methodist uniting Methodist church um, in the Lambie Heights, and um, next to it was a, a hall. I'm sorry, really, there we go. And we put a second story to so that grey bit there. We put a second story on top of the hall next door, and that's our bedroom and bathroom up there. And below it is um, the halls put some offices down the side, and that's where I'm sitting now. But the actual church itself, which we now call Hump Hall, is set up as a recording and performance space. And uh, that's uh, that's where Keith did um, one concert, two concerts. You twice you've been here, but I think one on your own and one with... Um, yeah, one and a half. With Flossie. <laughs> right, that's right. <laughs> uh, anyway, okay, so the story goes this. One of the times when Keith was staying here, um, he stayed overnight with us. And Guy and I had to go down to Canberra because we were going down to the National Folk Festival, but Keith was staying in Sydney one more night. So he, um, uh, we left him to it and got him to just leave the place to lock up. And when we got home from the, from the festival a few days later, we walked in the front door, as you can, as you can see there, and uh, on the floor were there some leaflets. Um, I actually meant to print some of them off, but um, they're sort of these little, little leaflets like this, but, you know, for his concert. And I find on the floor, and I said, "Oh well, it's right. The wind, the, wind, the wind, the wind must have uh, blown some onto the floor. That's right." So I picked them up, and then I walked into the church, and then there were a couple on the floor there too. Then I walked into the dining room, and there was some right up on the wall near the ceiling, and then there was some sitting everywhere. Everybody went. There were these leftover leaflets, and we'd open a drawer, and then at the, in the drawer was some more leaflets. And I, I, I kid you not, years later, we still find them. We open a drawer and dipped up some saucepans and the bloody, <laughs> bloody, you know, who else would do something as infantile, juvenile and stupid as that? Right? As, 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 <laughs> and then the other thing that I just really sticks in my mind, right? You've all been to festivals, right? In, in festivals, there's just so many different things on and at all different starting times. So there's always people who get up and, and leave early because they want to, They've got as much as that one and they want to get left because they've got to get to another one somewhere else. That, maybe they're even performing or whatever. So people forever sort of getting up and leaving in that run. And of course, think nothing of it. But of course, this mad bastard, right? This was in the Budawang, which if you've been to the National Folk Festival, is the largest venue, huge, huge venue, huge crowd there, right? And it's a really high stage, which is must be nearly six foot tall at the stage, or a good five foot tall. And so he was there up there on the stage before me and some poor bugger, got out of his seat in probably about the third or fourth row and just started walking up the aisle to, to leave. And he sort of turns says, Oi, what the hell are you doing? You know, screaming to the microphone. And he just jumps off the stage right down at a five foot and tears up the aisle. I don't mean just sort of a token running. I mean like really running as hard as he could, you know, screaming at this guy for being so rude as to leave. It was just so funny. Everyone just absolutely stitches laughing. There is no one else in the world that would have done something as rude and as childish as that. No one. <laughs> I give you Keith Bonnelly and uh, he can introduce his wonderful partner, Ursula, who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting. So now listen, a couple of rules before we do this. Um, it's really nice to, let me just see if I can actually, you all got asked permission. I, I think you're all um, asked whether you could, uh, permission for me to unmute you, I think, weren't you, when you came in? I think you might have been. So I might be able to unmute you. If I can, I will. Um, they used to be able to do that, but then they stopped it doing it because I think somebody got caught doing something they shouldn't be doing by the um, host unmuting them. But I, um, uh, we do need to be muted when Keith is actually performing and when Ursula is actually performing. But the moment they're finished, it's really nice if you unmute so we can react and, and chat and talk like this and that, right? So unmute between things, but mute during it, okay? Um, so everybody now, mute and um, we'll, over to you, Keith. Very good. Good game, Oh, okay. Oh, you didn't do that. You know how to mute, don't you, everybody, I should? Yeah. Over to you. We are overlapping stories, we are shared songs. Let's fade it out, night 
it's coming on like the whisper of a candle flame when it's gone we are just stories and songs only some stories and songs we are just stories it occurred to me one time that that's all we are everybody we're overlapping stories so um if you want to sing along your bit just goes overlapping stories we're all just tales that this world tells that this world tells so when you choose which ones to use, why well, choose them well? Choose well. Cause we are all loving stories. We are shared songs. Morning has faded now. Night's coming on like the whisper of a candle flame. Where it's gone, we are just stories and songs. Only some stories and songs. We are just stories. Overlapping stories. Sometimes you find the words won't rhyme. They just won't rhyme. For happy ever afters and once upon a time. Sometime we are overlapping stories, we are shared songs. Morning has faded now, night's come on, and the whisper of the candle flame when it's gone. We are, we are just stories and songs. Only some stories and songs. We are just stories. Overlapping stories. This is the easy bit. Everyone used to laugh at the woman who talked to the moon. They said she was a little bit crazy, and maybe they were right, for she would venture out regularly enough, standing, gazing up at its silvery orb in the middle of the night. <laughs> now, when I say everyone used to laugh at the woman who used to talk to the moon, that's not quite true. Some of her family, some of her relations, they were rather perturbed by her lunar conversations. And knowing that her favourite spot to talk to the moon was under the branches of this vast spreading oak tree. One night, early in the year, a family member decided to climb up into its highest boughs, put an end to a chatter once and for all. So that particular night, when the woman who talked to the moon went to talk to the moon, the conversation went something like this. Hello, moon. You're looking majestic as ever there. The clouds just scudding lightly across your face. Are you happy, gazing down on us all from the heavens? No. What moon? Why, 
are they not? I mean, it's it's such a beautiful time of year. It's it's so hopeful. And, uh, I can almost sense the birds asleep in the in the tree just above my head. Look, I'm just not happy. All right. But what is it? Said the one who talked to the moon. D don't you like the things I say to you? It's not that. It's just that people think that what you say to me is. It's, it's ridiculous. It makes you look stupid. Oh, I don't mind that, said the woman who talked to the moon. There's not enough laughter in this world. I, I, I don't mind looking foolish. Yeah, but they're not laughing with you. They're laughing at you. Look, I'd just rather you didn't speak to me anymore, all right? But the woman who talked to the moon was just about to agree to these terms. Oh, it pained her. But then she remembered, she just agreed not to say any more, and so sadly she trudged inside and went to bed. A few minutes later, the relative who'd been hiding in the bowels of the old tree clambered down, tiptoed inside, where the rest of the family were waiting to congratulate. They had a little drink to celebrate, <laughs> and then they too went to bed. Just before twilight, the woman who talked to the moon was back at the edge of the garden and gazing up into the oak. The moon still shone brightly. What was all that about? Said the woman. Sitting up there in the tree, pretending to be you. <laughs> they must really think I'm bonkers. Still. I think he meant well, said the moon. So when you find your own words to tell, your songs to sing, why those are the magic times, those times when words take wing. Take We are overlapping stories, we are shared songs. Morning has faded now, night's coming on, like the whisper of a candle flame. When it's gone, we are just stories and songs. Only some stories and songs. We are just stories. Crazy Bastard is also a really beautiful singer songwriter eh? and great guitarist, too. Tell me more, Wayne. Tell me more. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, this is, um, this is my far better half. This is um, the love of my life, Ursula. Um, and we met uh, at a festival called Whitby Festival nearly 10 years ago. Um, and uh, she's still. She still hasn't gotten rid of me. So we're gonna, we're just gonna sing you some songs and we're gonna tell you some stories and we're gonna do a bit, a bit of waffling. Um, no. and, and, and this is, this is, um, this is Ursula's request, this next song. Um, I might request that she do something that she doesn't really wanna do in a minute. What? But this is, uh, this is, you'll know this song, you just won't believe it, okay? And if you're gonna sing along, you need to sing along quick because otherwise 
you'll you'll miss you'll miss it. it. It's just a song about it's a song about the the imperative importance of being totally original whenever you write songs and and stories and stuff. So oh, I, I do I do storytelling as well, but I don't do storytelling when I'm alongside uh, Ursula because she she's really good and I'm you know not. But I've got a very this is I've written a very very short story. I think this is the shortest story ever written. This is a story called Noah's First Night on the Ark. <laughs> Um, and here's, uh, here's a song we were talking about. Have you seen the old man who walks the streets of Birmingham? It's a lesson too late for the learned made of sand, but he doesn't understand. Hey, Mr. Dream Seller, where have you been? Hey, Mr. Tambourine. Man, I've got the plagiarism blues. So bye, bye, Miss American Pie. Don't step on my blue sweatshirts. Ah, but I may as well try to catch the plagiarism blues, those plagiarism blues. So we'll do the chorus again. If you can't get the whole chorus, just sing. We are overlapping stories, we are shared songs. Now the chorus goes. I've got the plagiarism blues. So bye bye, Miss American Pie. Don't step on my blue red shoes Ah, but I may as well try, try and, and catch the pleasures of blues Those pleasures of blues Catch a boat to England, baby Maybe to Spain. If you could read my mind, love, in the early morning rain. I've looked at life from both sides now, from win and lose, and still somehow I've got the plagiarism blues. So bye bye, Miss American Pie. Don't step on my blue suede shoes. Ah, but I may as well try and catch the plagiarism blues. Those plagiarism Just yesterday morning, they let me know you were gone. Suzanne takes you down to a place near the river, homeward bound. I wish I was homeward bound. The first cut is the deepest. Baby, you know, the first cut is the plagiarism blues. Bye bye, Miss American Pie. Don't step on my blue Ah, but I may as well try and catch the plagiarism blues. Bye bye, Miss American Pie. Don't step on my blue switch.
blues Busted flat in Baton Rouge Waiting for the Pledgers and Blues While I'm running down the road Trying to loosen my load Got the Pledgers and Blues Waltz in Matilda Waltz in Matilda <laughs> I come from a land down under With the Pledgers and Blues May you never get the plagiarism <laughs> Have you counted how many songs are in that? Steve? No, because it's never the same twice. <laughs> it's, uh, it, uh, to, I missed out. I normally have Tinky Winky, oh. Dipsy, but Ursula hates that one. She <laughs> likes the song apart from the Tally Tubby's version. So, um, so we, we made a list, um, uh, and, and uh, Ursula's good on lists. I'm not so good on lists. Oh, so, so I'm going to have to go on a, off on a slight tangent. No. Um, yeah, and then what we'll do, um, we'll, we'll go to Magic Show after this. I'll do a little, uh, because Duncan is here, um, I'll tell a story that relates to Australia and to Duncan. Duncan uh, used to run a festival in this country called Guildfest. Guildford started out as Guildford Folk and Blues Festival, and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and it became Guildfest. Um, and Guildfest, it's a bit like Australia insofar as I get lots and lots of stories when I go to Guildfest and Australia. Um, I, I, I meant to do this around. I meant to find the email that I got uh, when, I, when I got off the plane at Melbourne for my last tour of Australia. And I meant to find this email because Bruce and Jill are what Watson are watching. Um, and uh, of course, Wayne and Guile are watching. And they saved my life, literally, um, on my last tour of Australia, because when I got off the plane, my agent, who shall re remain nameless, and I hope he's actually not watching, um, I had an email, I, and I, I opened my emails at Melbourne Airport to find an email from the agent saying, and I quote, whoops, I've given you the wrong dates. <laughs> so well, that's another story I want to tell you relating um, relating to Duncan, one time, I, I'm, Duncan, I'm guessing it was probably about 20 years ago, my favourite thing that ever happened on stage happened at Guildford Folk Festival, Guildfest, um, and I was on, I was on op an open air stage, which is, it's risky, but when it worked well, it was great, and it was Saturday afternoon, I used to host the stage all weekend, and I was on stage with a couple of hundred people sat in this beautiful natural amphitheater, uh, just listening to my silly songs, joining in, until from the back of the crowd came this guy, and I can picture him till this day. He was kind of, he was in his, must have been in his 70s or 80s, and he was dressed kind of half punk, half hippie, and he was wearing, this is the, this is the link to Australia bit, he was wearing a single flip-flop, a single thong, as you call them, and he came walking through the crowd and he completely stole the show because he was singing at the top of his lungs and he was singing, they tried to make me go to rehab. I said, no, no. And all of these hundreds of faces that were looking at me turned to watch this guy who was frankly quite more entertaining than I was. And they were all pointing at his feet. They'd all noticed his single flip-flop. Oh. And as he came through the crowd, still singing, tired to make me go through it, I, I just went up to the microphone and I said, hello, mate, have you lost a flip-flop? And he went, no, I've found a flip-flop. And he wandered <laughs> off into the annals of history. So that's more about thongs and flip-flops later. But I'm, um, this, is, this is my request from Ursula. This is, um, this is one of the first stories I ever heard Sora tell. <laughs> Don't judge books by their covers, my mother used to say. All isn't as it seems to be, it just 
appears that way. Look through the mask under the glass and open every door. If you don't find the answers there, girl, roll the dice some more. Ready? Yeah. For life is like a magic show. A mystery, the more you see, the less you seem to know. Things vanish who's fake and what is true. Come inside to enjoy the ride. The magic lies in you. So, this little scenario. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> this little scenario, which I, I often bridge um, songs into stories um, rather than the other way. That's kind of how we met. But, um, this is one of the first stories Keith ever tell. It's a little story about my mum. I often, uh, I often tell it just to, to kind of settle myself into story gigs. And uh, I have to tell you, my mum was quite a quite a magical, um, magical sort of character, really. And and I know everybody, you know, thinks of thinks of their mums like that. It's, it's a common thing. But my mum, like, she really was. She could do things. You see, my mum that other folks, mums couldn't do, certainly not around my end, like, um, I'll give you for instance, she could, um, she could play the piano with her eyes shut, she, uh, she knew loads of riddles and card tricks and stuff like that, she, um, she could transform, like, seemingly dead plants to grow miraculously into beanstalks, but her best trick, right, by far, her best magic trick, she could blow perfect rings with fag smoke, <laughs> And I, I was mesmerized by this. And I, and I asked her one day, who had taught her all this magic? And she, she fessed up. She fessed up straight away. And she said that Mr. Murray from the uh, post office had taught her. And I thought this was weird. And the, the thought flapped around my noddle for a good while afterwards, because I sure as hell hadn't noticed much magic cure from the stamps of a Wednesday afternoon. But then, one Sunday, one wet weekend, as I'm flicking through an old photo album, trying to digest some watery potato pie that had spun round too much tomato sauce in, and I was waiting for the Muppet Show to come on telly as that happened. I saw a picture of my mum dressed up, dressed up, weird, dressed as an illusionist assistant. Go on, have a good look. <laughs> And believe you me, folks, that is weird enough when you live in a place where everyone else's mum is a school dinner lady. <laughs> so I confronted her with this hard evidence and the sort of concern any kid would confront the mother having realised she gets off being sewn in half of a Saturday night. And she said it was true. She and Mr Murray, this fella from the post office, were indeed a double act. But, you know, like the rabbits out of an act kind, nothing dodgy, like... Whoop. Abracadabra. Furthermore, apparently, in the cobwebs of his youth, this Mr. Murray had been a world-class magician. He travelled everywhere. Europe, Africa, the Americas, pulling budgies from out folks' ears, coloured handkerchiefs from down his sleeves. But on doing a stint in Blackburn, up north in England, before clearing off to the Balkans, apparently he'd fallen head, or head over heels in love with Mrs. Murray, shacked up in the post office at the bottom of our road, and after that, he was only an illusionist on Saturdays. Still, they made the most of it. Him and my mum, there, her only a slip of a lass, and she would meet him every Saturday evening once the shop had shut and they'd had a chance to transform him into his evening suit and his red velvet tie, and her into a fish-coloured, fishnets and spandex. They took the club scene by storm, they did. They went everywhere. Blackburn Working Men's Club, Blackburn Amateur Dramatics Society, Blackburn Women's Institute, back again. <laughs> uh, but my mum said her favourite venue was a little place just outside Blackburn, a little town called Oswald Twizzle by the county border, yeah. She said she always knew she was there at her favourite venue because um, <clears throat> outside the club there was this little sign and it said, Welcome to Lancashire, where everyone counts. And someone had scrolled underneath in bright red paint and some can read. She said it made her feel at home. <laughs> but that was her favourite venue, you see, because there, 
and only there she got to do the magic feather trick. You see, the audience, as you might imagine, in a town called Oswald Twizzle, they were a peculiar bunch, gobbins, all of them. There's a saying up round our way that if you're born and raised um, within a mile of the fish and chip shop in Oswald Twizzle, you're a gobbin, and this lot were, definitely. They'd sit there, row upon row of them in club room, all waiting for something to happen, looking a bit too frighteningly alike. And I've been wondering, actually, this morning, you know, like, as I've been seeing people flash up on the screen, I'm, I'm wondering if you've any relatives that were, <laughs> suffice to say, they took a bit of warming up. So before the show would begin, Mr. Murray, he'd pull my mum aside and he'd say, now, think on, Marion, if after I've sewn you in half, pulled the pigeon out your belly and done the gag about the cesarean section, they're still looking blank or worse, concerned, you have my permission to use the magic feather. Now, from what I can glean, the way that the trick worked was from where my mum's head was positioned upside down in a box at the side of the stage, she could see the audience's reaction to Mr. Murray as he performed. She could gauge it. And so if she thought there was a particular audience member that was like too loud or um, like was like lagging and letting the side down, she would simply give a wink, instruct the magic feather where she wanted it to go. And Mr. Murray would then be able to levitate said feather to that person all the while carrying on with his hat so the feather went to work unnoticed said, mom that is genius give us a for instance she said well i would simply say magic feather magic feather comb over give a wink and the feather would fly from my hand to the balding gentleman on the fourth row tickling beneath his wrists he would naturally begin to giggle and laugh and the crowd naturally thinking then he'd been amused by something mr murray had said would start a rapturous applause. I said, that is genius. I could do with that magic feather. Have you still got it? She said, um, I'm afraid we had a little accident with it one evening and it's never really been the same since, to be honest. Well, it turns out that this evening in question, the gobbins had come good. They'd wolf whistled at the sight of my mum in a sequin belted girdle. And she'd got to use the magic feather twice. Once to a fellow on the front row, seven foot two, tickling your kneecaps. Magic feather, magic feather, very long legs. <laughs> and then once to a woman working the door with hands like cement shovels. Magic feather, magic feather, yet his armpit. <laughs> she'd set the crowd up. Oh absolutely steaming and by the time Mr Murray had done the cesarean section gag and pulled a pigeon out my mum's belly they had got a standing ovation suffice to say they were still on cloud nine as they trundled back into Blackburn in his Maurice Minor woody traveller wafting this magic feather around for all they were worth mum getting a little tiddly on sherry and lime they'd got about as far as the war memorial a once moving statue of a World War I soldier in action whose head had been knocked off during the 1950s. And so the council had committed, commissioned a modern artist to put the head back together and they'd made him look like Elmer Fudd. Well, they were there and they got pulled. Good evening. What's going on here then? Oh, sorry, officer. Sorry. We just got a bit... Uh carried away we've been doing a show and uh, our magic feathers come good for us again you are what are you talking about you have you been drinking uh, no well she has no uh, we've been doing uh, uh, an illusionist act what what is all illusion and with our, what, our magic feather is part of the act um it's also sort of an illusionist show you know what are you on about you you think I'm stupid? Magic feather? A magic feather? I'll tell you there. Magic feather my ass. Didn't work out too bad though, you see, because um, <clears throat> they got off with a caution because the officer had actually asked for it. So, and they did get the magic feather back, but it didn't really work the same after that. It tended to have a very adverse effect. It stank and knocked folks sick for a start, which confused the gobbins terribly. But my mum kept it as a memento of her glory days as Mr Murray's assistant 
And on this particular all important mother daughter bonding exercise, she took me upstairs and um, she showed me in a room and she pulled out from under the bed this battered brown leather stage case. And from inside it, she pulled a manila envelope, and reached in. Now, Ursula, Ursie, my daughter, I give this magic feather to you. Use it wisely. And I thanked her from the bottom of my heart and I promised her I always would. Magic feather. Magic feather. Play every hand like it's your last. Beware the jack of hearts. Conjure small feathers endlessly, be colourful and smart. Don't let them put you in a box and saw you down the middle. Stay home, my love, and remember there's magic in a riddle. For life is like a magic. A mystery, the more you see, the less you seem to know. Things vanish. All inside to enjoy the ride. The magic light in you. That's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. Brilliant. Hey, listen, everybody, it'd be really nice if um if you did unmute in the in the in-between things so that you know it's just a bit more interaction. But uh it, it's up to you. It's up to you. Absolutely. Look, while we while we got stopped, I just wanted to um uh the if you'd like to make a contribution to to keep an Ursula, I mean, it's not a lot of festival, not a lot of festival, not a lot of festival. Hang on, if you're unmuted, don't talk now, please. I'm talking. Um, oh, yes. If it's um, there's not, but not a lot of festivals for them. So a lot of living in lately. So if you can afford to make a contribution, would be great. The way to do it is I'm going to send through the chat um, to everybody, everyone. This is the link to Keith as PayPal. Um, there it is. So if you just click on that, then you can just make a donation to um, to Keith and uh, Ursula for today. It's, I know it just says crazy Keith Bonnelly, but I'm, I'm assured that Ursula will get something out of it. So, yeah. I, I think, yeah, <laughs> I think it, it'll go in the crazy Keith Donnelly fund for sure. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and if you if you have any difficulty with that, um, and if you see me, I'll be you like, know, I can do it and on your behalf and you really find that hard. But you do need to have a PayPal um, account, but it's a very good thing to have anyway. I, I once put money for payment down on something that ended up not getting made because the company went bankrupt. And there was $900 and I got all my money back because I paid it through PayPal. So PayPal gave me all my money back. So it's a good thing to actually do. I'm, I'm not getting a commission for PayPal. I'm just saying it's probably worthwhile because then things like this you can do easily too. Anyway, back to um, back to so there's the stars and souls and um, stay you stay unmuted while he's talking, but then then mute when he starts talking. Go. Oh, no. shut up! I know you're not muted. Don't be a smart eye. <laughs> so there was mention in Ursula's wonderful magic show story of the Women's Institute. Um, I think you call it the Townswomen's Guild in Australia. See, I do my research on these things. Um, and one of the first paid gigs I ever, ever did back in the late 70s, but don't do the sums there, um, was in a, there's a town in Essex in the UK, and the town's called Ugly, and it's spelled U-G-L-E-Y. And the posh locals in Ugly insist it should be pronounced Ugly, but I'm sorry, U-G-L-E-Y 
where I come from, that's pronounced ugly. Um, and I played there again recently, just just over a year ago. Just it was one of the one of the final gigs I did before the zombie apocalypse. For the first time I played there, I was tickled pink when someone told me that the Women's Institute in the town of Ugly had decided to change its name from the Ugly Women's Institute to, <laughs> and they changed it to the Women's Institute Ugly Branch. Uh, <laughs> that's not the problem. Perfect. <clears throat> so I have been telling that story for 40 odd years and as i travel around uh, the story gets it gets added to uh, and because there's strange place names everywhere there's there's a place in in england part of bradford in england which is called idle and idle in bradford genuinely has the biggest working men's club in the world the idle working men's club you can't make this stuff up i've tried you can't make it up. but anyway I was telling the ugly story <clears throat> a couple of years ago uh, in a, an art centre in Exeter down in the southwest of the UK. Um, and I told the story and it had gone well and I'd done my first half and everyone was coming up at half time to buy my CD, which you don't have to worry about today, by the way, unless you want to do it online. But this woman stood in the queue <clears throat> and I say queue, it was at least two people. She was second. And when she got to the front of the queue, she, she was very excited. She said, you know the story you told about the Women's Institute and ugly? And I said, yes, yes, calm down. She said, you're never going to believe this, but I am in the Women's Institute and I actually come from, and I thought she was going to say ugly. And I said, ugly? She went, no, Kent. And I said, all right. Yeah. <laughs> she said, no, you don't understand. I'm from a town in Kent called Luce. And I said, get lost, the Loose Women's Institute. She said, no, we call it the Women's Institute for Loose Women. So <laughs> they, it's basically the same gag, but it's, it's true, so I can tell it twice. <laughs> so if, you're ever, if you're ever in Britain, I was going to say Great Britain, but let's not say that. If you're ever over here, and if you ever happen to be driving from London to Cambridge on the M11, Keep an eye out because you'll see Ugly. It's quite a big town. About mm -hmm. halfway up on the left-hand side, that's where Ugly is. Now, just above it, there's a little village called Ugly Green. This is true. And about five miles up on the other side of the motorway, there's a town called Nasty. <laughs> and I've got some friends who know I've been telling this story forever. And they sent me this newspaper cutting from a lo from local newspaper in, and it actually, this is Cubs on a dib dib dob true. This newspaper cutting said, nasty man marries ugly green woman. <laughs> right. So here's, um, here's a song and I, we'll, we'll do this song. And then I think, um, I think someone else might be going to do a song um, after this song, just to break it up a little bit, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Let me sing you this song first. This is, um, this is a song about, well, it kind of sums up everything. It's all falling apart. Not yet. It's all falling apart. It's all falling apart around me. I'm beginning to wonder whether I'll be able to put it back together Because it's all falling apart Easy chorus if you want to sing It's all falling apart <laughs> It's all falling apart around me ah, 
I'm beginning to wonder whether I'll be able to put it back together. Because it's all falling apart around. Ta da! A world premiere. That was a world premiere of that song. <laughs> so, Wayne, do we have a Graham in the house? Well, we, we don't. Um, no, he emailed, it, uh, he emailed me at, at 6.15 saying that he's, uh, he's, he's got to go out and walk, and walk his dog with his grandchildren. Um, and I, then I emailed back saying the concert doesn't start till 9 o'clock. Uh, <laughs> but I haven't heard back from him. But Bruce, I've just texted Bruce to ask, but he hasn't seen my text. Bruce, are you in a position? Would you like to do a song? Oh, you're muted, Bruce. Oh, there we go. Just typing a reply, and I'm a very slow typist. Oh. I thought I was really just enjoying sitting back and listening, really. I want to see more of Keith and Ursula. Okay, well, uh, it was just that we thought that maybe Graham, Graham Moore might have, or might, have, might have been here. And um, I'm hoping to do one of these with Graham Moore. Have you all heard of Graham Moore? Hands up, wave, wave if you know who I'm talking about, Graham Moore. He, I'm surprised that because um, he's an English singer songwriter um, and uh, he's written some fabulous songs which I first heard Roy Bailey doing. Um, but, um, and Lucy Woven, the, the group that I've done, we've done eight of, eight of his songs um, over the time. And um, a lot of them are from a musical uh, about the Toll Puddle Martyrs that he wrote. And that musical about Toll Puddle Martyrs is apparently performed every year at, um, in, in the town where it all happened. And they're just some absolutely fabulous songs. Um, you should look into it. But I just thought that Graham Moore would make a really wonderful one of these because he's got all these fabulous, fabulous songs and stories that he can tell about that. And so I invited him to be along today just to get the, high, get the hang of it, but um, it didn't seem like it would work out. But um, William, yes, can I, can, I, can I make a request? If the wonderful Ian Bland is still there, he's an incredible poet. Ian, will you do us a poem? Have you got time to do us a poem, mate? Oh, yep, no, no. Excellent then. All right, over to you then, Ian. Hang on, you're, you're muted, Ian. That's the best way to go like that. <laughs> it's actually a wordless poem, which is. <laughs> uh, I haven't yeah. used it, but I'm going to do it at the first one I opened, which is Manakano, um, which is a bit long, so I might go for a shorter one. Uh, I might go for Pearls, if I can find it. Um, okay. Aged 95, Elsie Bent departed of this earth. A pair of pink pearl earrings, all she left of any worth. Her nieces, Gail and Bronwyn, had long coveted those pearls, while Elsie had long tired of being pressured by the girls. She would teach them both a lesson though never one to preach. To her niece's irritation, they were left one earring each. Now earrings, as with cufflinks, are no use unless a pair. Elsie hoped her legacy would encourage them to share. Alas, the girl's belligerence she'd underestimated. Each, despite the other, had one ear amputated. A path Though not intended, Elsie helped to pave for warning to those who seek to dictate from the grave. Her executor remarked on hearing of the news, I suppose we should be thankful Elsie didn't leave them shoes. Earrings shine no brighter than what lies between the ears. Pearls to the oyster are nothing more than tears. Oh. 
Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a talented, a tough, talented Aussie, eh? Yeah. Oh, there's, yeah, he, they're he all in is. Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got another short one? Do, do an encore, Ian. Uh, um, I don't know. I'll, I will do another sardonic uh, number. Orange. Although, I've got to say, this one is no longer accurate because... All the colours, when I wrote this poem, these colours were out of fashion. They're all back in fashion now, but we'll forget that. Beverly Purvis to the 70s was chained. While that decade ended long ago, Beverly remained. Lava lamps, egg chairs, vibrant and pristine. The decor, a subtle blend of orange and lime green. Camisoles and hot pants, high-waisted denim flares, spaghetti strap tank tops, orange like the chairs. A chrome atom chandelier bathed the lounge in light. The kitchen glazed with orange tiles, not a pastel tone in sight. Once the height of fashion, now terribly outdated. To everyone but Beverly, the colour scheme now grated. One night in 1998, as Bev took off her choker, she fancied a Virginia Slim, she'd always been a smoker. While searching for her lighter in her boho crocheted bag, it tangled in the carpet, an orange long pile shag. Bev fell into the fondue set, the skewers went through her knees, then head first in the dipping pot, and drowned in molten cheese. It was death by misadventure, the coroner recorded. While the cause was indisputable, the details were more, were more sordid. Bev hadn't choked on Stilton, Danish blue or brie. It was common processed cheddar, so 1973. Her things went to the charity shop and in time began to rot till a dealer spied them out the back, paid 20 bucks the lot. Now he's asking 1500 for the vinyl bar stools each, no longer classed as orange, no, they're autumn sunset peach. The orange velvet poof that was such a pig to clean is now listed as a love seat in atomic tangerine. Mm -hmm. Fashion is a fickle beast, both arrogant and chaste. We so insecure, entrusted with our taste. A hue once loved repels our, as our sense of judgment falters. It is us who dull, not colours, for the rainbow never falters. Very good. Yeah. And listen, you should know, if you don't know, uh, Ian is also a brilliant singer-songwriter. So, um, so check him out at ianbland.au or whatever yeah. it is. .com.au <laughs> or you end up with a British poet, which when I last played at the Warwick Festival and uh, looked online at the uh, program and his photograph was there because I'd left the AU off the uh, the album. <laughs> I thought you looked good in that photo. <laughs> yeah, and about twenty years younger. <laughs> so yeah, look, this is um, this is a song. Everything in this song genuinely happened on an Australian tour, uh, and I normally have to spend ten minutes ex explaining this song, but you guys will understand it all. And this is the hat. This is the hat that gets mentioned. God, I love this country. But it scares me half to death Cause you've got things that bite and sting Might take away my breath So I shake my shoes And I check my loose And I'm happy doing that But I never thought That I would find a red back in my hat But I did 
upon a red back in my hat. A red back in my hat. I never thought that I would find a red back in my hat. So that's the chorus. Get it next time. Except it's totally different next time. It's a long way up to Darwin on the road to Humpty Doo. Had a couple of days in that jungle place we were only passing through. So I quickly stripped and I skinny dipped in the bay by the old gum tree. How was I to know there would be crocodiles in the sea? Crocodiles in the sea? They've got crocodiles in the sea. What are you doing, Wayne? They've got crocodiles in the sea. Are they going for a swim? How was I to know there would be crocodiles in the sea? Well, by the time we got to Alice, we were scarecrows, there's no doubt. I'd bust a shoe, climb an Uluru, and my boxes were inside out. But when a bloke offered me his spare thongs, I looked dumbstruck, I suppose. Cause where I come from, we don't wear things like thongs around our toes. Oh, thongs around our toes. We don't wear thongs around our toes. Where I come from, we don't wear things like thongs around our toes. Do I believe they're doing mid wheels? Tommy Emmanuel. <laughs> hey, I did that. I did that joke one time at the National Folk Festival in Canberra, and I looked up. Tommy Emmanuel was sat in the front row. I thought, let him learn. Let him learn. Well, pretty soon I've got to leave you, and who knows when I'll return? I got other roads to walk down. I got bridges still to burn. Oh, but every place I show this face, I'll be missing your land, so. I will sing this song about crocs and thongs, cobwebs in my chapeau. Cobwebs in my chapeau. Cobwebs in my chapeau. I sing this song about crocs and thongs, cobwebs in my chapeau. Cobwebs in my chapeau. Cobwebs in my chapeau. Yes, I'll sing this song about crocs and thongs, cobwebs in my chapeau. Now, if I was doing this gig for anywhere else in the world, I usually finish with a didgeridoo solo. But I thought, oh, I can't play didgeridoo when it, but I can just, there's six didgeridoos. <laughs> pass me one, pass me a didgeridoo. Anyone that? Just to prove I'm not bluffing. country, but it scares me half to death. <laughs> Thank you. There was a little, at the end of my gig, there was a little red bug in my hat. There, and I put that hat on several of the stories. So, um,
Ursula is also not only a singer, so, uh, not only a storyteller, she's also a wonderful singer songwriter and she's chosen to sing you this one. Um, yeah, I um, <laughs> that's quite a build up actually. Um, so um, I do a lot. I, I use, as I said earlier, I use songs kind of to frame my stories really. Um, this one, I, I suppose it's, it's kind of a kid's song really. I, yeah, it's, it's one of those like ambiguous songs. Um, but it goes with a, um, a story set that um, is, is not at all, but um, it, it, it's a bit fun. And it's called, there are fairies in the gutter, as in fairies, but less of those um, Victorian pinky winged gossamer creatures and more like these bumbling eccentrics that you might find as positive role models in the grit and grime of urban decay, those kind of fairies. And actually, we don't say fairies, we say furries. Um, and this little song is called There Are Fairies in the Gutter. Um, you might want to sing along. There are fairies in the gutter. There must be, they come in all kinds. Folks will tell you I'm bonkers, but it's just they've closed their minds. So anyway, I stood my in empty crisp packets, in cobwebs and puddles, it's true. And if you believe in the gutter fairies, well, they might believe in you. They sometimes come when you've been crying, or you get that weird gleam in your room. Or if there's a crack in the window, you screw up your eyes at the moon. And sometimes they come when you're feeling quite small and you've got what big folk call the blues. The little ones come, kick you up the bum, singing a up, stand tall in your shoes. Ooh, I was quite trained, you know. Me too. There's fairies in the gutter. There must be, they come in all kinds. Folks will tell you I'm bonkers, but it's just they close their minds. So just let's stop. Can we get everybody put your mics on? Yeah, and I want you to try this line. It's called, um, the line goes, so anyway, I've seen them hiding in empty crisp packets because that's where fairies hide up in Lancashire. So anyway, I've seen them hiding in empty crisp packets. You might argue that that line doesn't fit. It's not true. It fits perfectly if you just approach it with great conviction. So try it slowly first, just, just everybody together. So anyway, I've seen them hiding in empty crisp packets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all you've got to do is go, so anyway, after my dinner empty crisp packets, and then it fits. <laughs> yeah. So it goes, there are fairies in the there are fairies in the gutter. There must be the coming all kinds. Folks will tell you I'm bonkers, but it's just the close of the minds. So anyway, I've seen them hiding in empty crisp packets. Yeah, and that's the line. Okay. Sing along. Sing along. Keith will Keith will be loud enough for all of us, but um, sing along. There are fairies in the gutter. There must be they come in all kinds. Folks will tell you I'm bonkers. Folks will tell you I'm bonkers. They just the mind. It's just they've closed their minds. This is the big line. So anyway, I've seen a man in the gutter. And if you believe in the gutter fairies, if you believe in the gutter, Believe in you. You'll have another go. Can you give me a song? Yeah, Max. Have you ever wondered how dandelions grow in the midst of a bleak concrete jungle? Or how some kids bounce back though they've grown up so slack and are always in some sort of bungle? Or how it is that things like glass and ice can sparkle just like the crown jewels? Folks will say it's a mystery, but I know it's my history. And who's the real fools? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> the fairies in the gutter. 
coming all cash. They must be the coming all cash. Box will tell you I'm bonkers. Box will tell you I'm bonkers. It's just Piff Clues Day. So where are we going? So where are we asking the man in the empty crisp packet? So where are we asking the man in the empty crisp packet? Then cobwebs and puddles in June. And if you believe in the butterflies, well, they might. Hold on. They might. They might. If they think you're all right, the Lancashire fairies, you see, they're quite awful. If they think you're all right, they think you're all right. I believe in you. Well, it wasn't too bad, was it? Don't you meet yourselves again now. Here's a little, um, just occurred to me, it occurred to me last night when I was thinking of things I could sing. Here's this, hi, Car Car uh, Carol. Um, here's a song I wrote in Humph Hall. In Humph oh. Hall. In Humph Hall. I wrote, a, I wrote a Christmas song and this one, the last time I was there. This is the children's song. Said the little crab to the kangaroo, I'm in love with you, could you love me too? Said the kangaroo to the little crab, I don't know how this all work, but let's give it a stab. One walked side to side, whilst the other hopped. And though it wasn't easy, their loving never stopped. And who should come along almost before they knew? Seven kangaroos and one little crabaroo. The crabaroo song! <laughs> story song and here's a love story told by Ursula oh is it okay we're way off script now <laughs> yeah. okay so um yeah I'll do this one um I um so be just before lockdown when I um I moved in with Keith um I, what uh, you did what <laughs> that's why you're here all the time I um I lived um, up in the north of England, um, a beautiful little town called Hebden Bridge, which is kind of um, west of east um, in the north of England. And um, it's, yeah, it works, that's right. Uh, and it's quite, it's a real picturesque little tourist town, but it's, it's always on the news because it's susceptible to flooding. And uh, anyway, the, the, by the by kind of thing, but, um, I'm a, I'm a keen gardener and I remember the year before the last big big floods um, in Hebden Bridge I had really like got seriously into it to the to the extent that I'd actually won um, most inspiring small garden which I think is like the the best local um, accolade I've, 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 I've ever had it was uh, yeah I was very proud and so the following year that I, I really like immersed myself in, into the garden and like checking the soil qualities and and testing everything that could grow in pots because the gardens up in up in the north of England the, the, the front yards really every, everything's everything's in pots but um I'd, I'd done well everything was planted and then the floods came and, and it was just decimated, all washed away. But I, I felt like I couldn't complain because I got friends who lived at the bottom of the town um, who'd lost lost much work. Worse, you know, businesses had gone under, and uh, and my little house on the hill was intact. So I was out in the garden this particular morning, and I'm salvaging what I can from all all, all the debris and uh, the herbs. Lots of my herbs are pretty hardy. They're doing all right, and so I'm, I'm dredging up what I could and and, and repotting, and, and this voice comes over the wall, and the voice says, uh, Ooh, "Ursula, is that 
is that mint you've got there? I was wondering if I could have a bit. And I turned and it's my neighbour, Elsie. And uh, I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I said, I think this is going to be all right. I think I can probably save this. Um, and I cut a, a, a big bunch off. And then I said, hey, is, is this enough? She went, well, I might need a bit more. And then I suddenly took stock of her and I said, Elsie, I said, you, you're looking amazing. Did you, were you not affected? Did you, did you not get flooded out or anything? She went, well, no, not exactly. And to be honest, I've been a bit preoccupied. <laughs> and then I really took her in. And I mean, she's cracking on in years, is, is Elsie. She were, she was in her early nineties. And I noticed how her skin was smooth and she looked like 30 years younger. And I said, what's going on? She said, well, I've, uh, everything's been passing me by because, uh, uh, I've met a man and I said right she says uh, actually two <laughs> so now she's got my full attention so I do what we always used to do in North Yorkshire when you're talking to your neighbours you go and stand like this over the garden wall went inside made a cup of tea and I come back and I went back go on tell me more she said well it sort of started I was just the other few weeks ago I was sat downstairs and I must have drifted off listening to gardeners question time and I heard a voice and the voice went Elsie I said well were you not worried? Do you not think you should see a doctor? She says, no. She said, because I knew whose voice it were. I've heard it before. And the voice came again and it went, Elsie, I'm soon coming for you. I said, well, what did you do? She says, well, I opened my eyes. When I opened my eyes, he were in front of me, clear as day. And though he were having on his tall hat and his big cloak covering his hoover feet, he weren't fooling anybody. I says, oh, hello, it's you, is it? He said, I've come to tell you, Elsie, your time on earth is short. Soon, I will be coming for you. I said, oh, my God, Elsie, what did you say? She said, well, she said, uh, I, uh, I said, well, you're, uh, you're being quite assumptuous there that I might want to come with you. I haven't decided where I'm going yet. I said, really? She said, yeah, really. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm quite ready to leave anyway. And if you want me to leave with you, you better be making it worth my while. Well, he looked at me askance at that. I said, right. I see. Well, then let me, let me grant you three wishes, Elsie. I'll grant you three wishes. And if you're satisfied with these wishes, how about at the end of the year, your soul becomes mine? Yeah, all right. Well, go on then, see what you can do. Well, make your wish. I said, well, what did you wish for, Elsie? She said, well, I just wanted to put him to test, really, and I still am, you know, that I, 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 weren't, I weren't smitten or anything, so... I says, right, well, I were, I'm, I've been thinking for years about getting a new bedroom done and getting a bedroom in, but um, I were waiting for sales. But I suppose if you're going to bump me off by the end of the year, well, there's no point waiting for any sales, are there? So I'll, uh, yeah, I'd like, I'd like my bedroom, a new bedroom fitted. And he nodded at me. Your wish is my command. Go, have a look. So I did. I went to the bottom of the stairs and I, I struggled upstairs and I get some stair lift. <laughs> then I goes up to the bedroom and oh, it were beautiful. It were lovely. I mean, it were more, it weren't Marks and Spencer, if you know what I mean. I, I would have preferred it in Magnolia and he'd done it in Peach, but I weren't going to split hers. It were, oh, it were lovely. So I comes back down. <laughs> oh. Thank you very much, Lou. You don't mind if I call you Lou, do you? Oh, it's beautiful. Thank you. I told you. I can do anything. Now, Elsie, what is your second wish? And she says to me, well, that were easy. I was that knackered and I'd only been to the bottom of the stairs and got that stir lift. I says, well, you know, Lou, if, if this is, if we're really on for this and I've only got so much time left, then I would like the rest of my days 
to be clear of pain. I'd love my back straight again. I'd love, I'd love my hair on my head and not out my nostrils and on my chin. I'd, I'd love to my skin to feel tall, to my body to feel lithe and to feel sexy. And he said, your wish is my command. And well, well, you can see for yourself. I, I am as you see me now, Ursula. I said, brilliant. And then I just looked at her because she weren't saying anymore. Well, go on. So what were your third wish? And at this, she kind of blushed red and she, she looked all coy and that, which is a bit creepy on a 90 odd year old woman. And she said, oh, I, don't, I don't really like to say. I said, well, go on, you can't tell me half a story and then, and then not tell me what you wish for your third thing. She said, well, ah. It were an uncomfortable silence, let's just say, but he seemed to know what I was thinking, as, as you might imagine. And uh, I explained to him, it's been many years since our Frank died, and I haven't really, I've never looked at another. I need to trust 